You are listening to The Pilgrim on the 405 with Will Christ. Join him as he and his guests discover how businesses thrive in California. Well, welcome to The Pilgrim on the 405. We've got a great guest today. Uh, many of you know Bill Carpu, the CEO of Octane. So we're going to get a chance to dig deep into Octane and find out a little bit more about what's going on with Octane. There's some big moves coming up in the near future, making some big uh, uh, some some big splashes in how uh, how companies in Orange County can participate in Octane. So welcome, Bill. Thanks very much, Will. Glad to be here. So, so tell us tell us a little bit about uh, about how you became the CEO of Octane. Well, it's a little bit of an interesting story. I was uh, I've, I've been in California since 1998. Uh, what brought me out here was a bigger company to to run the west uh, western part of the country. Um, we eventually sold the business to uh, to Rico, and uh, I then went into private equity. I was an operating partner at Blackstone, and uh, you know, running a company actually in the Detroit area, and at that time, uh, as we as we exited that particular investment, looking for the next thing to do, whether it was staying with Blackstone and private equity, uh, I was contacted by several board members uh, of Octane and asked if I wanted to uh, join the organization. Uh, the current CEO, who had done a great job, was moving on to something different. And, you know, and my first reaction was, I don't know, I've never re- really run a nonprofit before. Is that is that really the right fit for me? And the more I dug under the hood and, and spoke to people, it just seemed like a tremendous opportunity, uh, you know, really to take something and white sheet it and, you know, be able to make something even bigger out of what was already running pretty well. So you had some great plans when you got here. Yeah, you know, I look at it, I, 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 think, I think what I really kind of key from my perspective is that I've gone into companies before and fixed troubled organizations. And this was anything but that. It was being run really well. Financially, Octane was in great shape. It, it, had, a, it had a very good following. And, um, you know, what I, what I kind of envisioned was a different trajectory for the organization and where we could go and, a, a, you know, an addition of services and, uh, and products that we could bring to the market and really help uh, accelerate and elevate the ecosystem, the innovation ecosystem here in Orange County. So, w- when you look back from the time that you came to now, what would you pick out as being the uh, the, the biggest highlight? You know, there's a there's a couple of different things. I mean, first of all, there's just a personal satisfaction level of coming to work each day and knowing that you're helping companies, you're helping create jobs, you're helping the economic development. Uh, of the of the area and really building something, uh, but more so than that is just the observation that I've had in the evolution of the ecosystem. Um, you know, if I look back, and I've been here, it, it'll be five years in April. When I first came, there was a, a lot of people as I met them for the first time on my board, sponsors, partners, just people out in the ecosystem that were really trying to convince me that there was not an ecosystem here, and. Um, I, I started to accept that. I started to think, wow, there, there, there really isn't. And then after a while, kind of peeling that back, found that there's a tremendous ecosystem here in, 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 in uh, uh, Southern California and specifically Orange County. So I think a personal satisfaction level is just that's, you know, that's kind of been created. I've seen it evolve. I've seen a lot of organizations get involved and the collaboration that's really gone on. Um, you know, the other thing is I just love coming to work every day. I mean, I love my job. I think I've got one of the best jobs you could possibly have. And, you know, at this, at this stage in my life, it suits me really well. Well, that's great. That's wonderful. When, when you use the word ecosystem, what, what, does, what do you mean by that? You know, it's a broad term in a lot of sense. Uh, you know, what, when I look at it, I look at it around innovation. So it would incorporate the investors, the entrepreneurs, the professional service firms that help these companies grow, and the small and mid-sized businesses, as well as the large institutions that, that basically provide some level of support for these organizations, either in guidance or financially. So it's, a, it, it's really the community. It's the innovation community. And how can it all come together? Well, if, if someone wanted to join the ecosystem, want to become part of this, how would they do that? Well, you know, of course, you could become a member of Octane. Uh, you, you know, that's that's one way. Uh, but there's a lot of other organizations out there too. And you know, we we really 
we ask, we encourage organizations to get involved. If it's not with Octane, it's with someone else uh, that's basically supporting the innovation ecosystem. Now, you know, of course, in my role, I'd be uh, misplaced if I didn't think that we're we're at least the uh, you know one of the top choices, if not the top choice, uh, you, you know, from that perspective. But get involved in what really suits you. Okay, so I, I think there's different entry levels too. If you're an investor and you're a later stage investor, Octane's a great place for you to become involved. If you're a really early stage investor on the angel round, maybe one of the incubators is a, is a, is a better place. And by the way, I think what's important when we talk about engagement and involvement in the ecosystem, it's not an either or. So it doesn't mean that you have to choose one organization or choose one route. Uh, the most impactful individuals that contribute to the ecosystem have um, uh, multiple lanes that they're playing in with multiple organizations, and they're contributing across the board. Well, well, as, as you think about as you think about the coming coming year, uh, what are you most excited about? I think the the you know the component that I would be the most excited about is really our our OES platform. That's that stands for Octane Enterprise Solutions. It's a revenue model shift on our part. So, you know, one of the one of the challenges that we've had is a nonprofit model is just really not scalable. Uh, it, 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 it doesn't enable us to do all of the things that we want to do when you're completely reliant on sponsors and members. So OES was created in part to create a different revenue stream to Octane, but more importantly, to create a greater sense of urgency for companies to grow, stay here, and create jobs. So we like to think of the platform as speed to revenue and speed to operational uh, efficiency or, uh, or, or capital. So when you look at those two combined, um, what we're really excited about with OES is the impact it will have on organizations to grow, create jobs, and sustain themselves here in Orange County and across the Southern California region. Well, as you, as you, you, you think about encouraging uh, innovation in the community – what what would you say are the top three limitations or constraints to uh, a, 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 a company growing, moving forward in the innovative community? And in in that question, you're talking more about a, a specific startup. Well, startup or it could be one that's in a later stage. But what are the what are the barriers? What are the constraints? So I, I'd say there's three that you know that really come to mind. One is capital or or lack of capital. Uh, you know, which is going to is going to be is going to impact smaller companies or early stage companies more significantly. The second is talent, and we see that more and more that as we're, we're creating companies that create jobs and have needs to fill jobs, there's just not a match necessarily with the talent that's here. Um, and the third is operational expertise. Is you know, as a younger company, uh, do you have what it takes to really grow the company? move up the revenue chain, and the relationships to, to, to grow your company. So those are three that the OES platform, again, focuses on very keenly. All right, so capital, you bring capital by uh, attracting investors to be part of Octane. And, and what would you say, on a scale of 1 to 10, where, where is our capital uh, resources in Orange County today? So... Uh, there's it's there there's a dual answer in that. So one is that for the most part, companies that are fundable, uh, we have been we have been able to achieve in getting them funding. Uh, the caveat in that is the majority of that comes from outside the area. So if we were just measuring the availability of capital, and when I talk about this, it's institutional capital that's headquartered in Southern California. It's very limited. So if you, if you as an entrepreneur do not have deep relationships with investors outside of this area, if you do not rely on an incubator, accelerator, or organization such as Octane, you're going to have difficulty getting funded. Um, the majority, uh, I'll, I'll just give you a, a, a more recent statistic, uh, we had a record first half of, of, of 2019 in terms of capital that companies that have used or come through Launchpad raised. As a matter of fact, we eclipsed every th the, the, the entire number that we did in 2018. 
uh, it was it, it exceeded three hundred million dollars. The, the which is the good news. The bad news is only three point three percent of that came from Southern California. The majority came from either Silicon Valley, Boston, or New York. And actually, the majority came from Boston. Well, now, is, does that reflect that there is a paucity of of capital in Southern California, investable capital? It's an interesting point, and what what there is, and I think we all probably know this intuitively, there's an enormous amount of private wealth. There's an enormous amount of wealth that exists in Southern California. However, it's still, the majority of it is tied up in real estate and other hard assets and not necessarily in venture. Um, you know, so when I, when I say about the lack of capital, it's probably not on a per capita basis or an individual basis. It's just it's institutional capital that's headquartered here. Part of it could be because there's venture firms that are an hour flight away. And, uh, you know, some of the bigger organizations, whether it's NEA or Clyder Perkins or, or Sequoia, and they certainly have investors from Southern California. Um, but we feel an important attribute or important component of building an ecosystem is to have headquartered-based capital here. And the reason for that is, um, and I'll just give you an example, it, Boston being a, a, a big source of capital, when you look at that, the majority of those investors in a Boston VC firm are from the New England or at, le- or at least the Northeast area. So once that firm comes in, invests in Southern California technology company, MedTech, technology, whatever, at the end of the day, the proceeds, the profits of that investment and the fees all go back to the Boston ecosystem. So while it's great for the company that's here, while it's great for the management team, while it's built that company, it hasn't had the type of implication positively that it could have on this community, on this ecosystem, if that capital was headquartered here. So would you say that uh, we're house rich and cash poor? (laughs) Uh, That's probably a decent analogy, yeah, yeah. Now, Now, with that, one of the things that we've incorporated recently, again, under the OES banner, uh, is to create a private investor network. So kind of bypassing the fact that eventually, you know, we're going to, we're going to work with other organizations and bring more venture capital here that's headquartered here. And I could, I could talk about that in a moment because we, we have done that directly with uh, Visionary Ventures. Um, but, but specifically, we've brought individuals to the table that are high net worth that are investors in early stage companies, and we've tried bringing them into some of the earlier rounds that companies need that have difficulty. And those could be a million, two million, three million dollar rounds. And what we're providing that specific investor with is a set of data and analytics that enables them to make that decision uh, with a little bit less emotion and more data-based. All right, so so there's one source of, of capital is individual high net worth individuals correct and and another source is institutional investments uh, from major companies that m- make their living out of investing and, and what what are we doing to grow attract uh, facilitate those major investment companies do we have any in Southern California? So and there, there's also a third source, which is strategic. So mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Your, your, bigger, your bigger medical technology companies and bigger technology companies generally have a venture arm, mm-hmm. and they look to make investments and really minimize their, you know, it's like small R, big D. Right. So, uh, you know, reduce their research uh, 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 expenses. But, but those, those don't tend to be headquartered in Southern California, do they? Well, some, some are, but, but uh, you know, you're right. There's only a limited number of those companies that are, that are here. Um, but going back to your question on, on the venture, we've got relationships. Uh, and again, many organizations have relationships with investors, big institutional investors outside of this area. And what we do is we show them deals. Uh, so, we're facilitating those discussions. Mm-hmm. That capital is coming in. The missing piece is how do we get new venture firms to be actually headquartered here, right. raise capital here, and that's a much slower slog. So um, one of the aspects is there's an organization right now that is out and very actively 
pursuing a master fund that will be invested in organizations that uh, uh, will focus and, and put a headquarters location here. And they're going out to companies on a, on a company basis and helping raise that master fund. Um, the other thing that we did a couple of years ago is we, uh, we, we founded a, a firm called Visionary Ventures. Mm-hmm. And so Visionary Ventures was, uh, has been a very successful fund, uh, ranked as one of the top medical technology funds specific to ophthalmology. Uh, it was created in 2015, has had terrific results to date, uh, two liquidity events, returned almost all the uh, um, the principal to the initial investors and uh, you know has had has had substantial returns we're now in a second raise of visionary so you know we're I feel we're doing our part in in that um, but whether whether that fund and I mean that that fund may end up being a hundred million dollars at the final close uh, you know, we don't really want to disclose any specifics on that at this point. But whether it was a hundred or five hundred million, it, 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 it's such a minimal impact on what Southern California really needs. Uh, you know, we, we just want to encourage more sources of capital to be headquartered here. Well, why is it that Boston uh, and Silicon Valley have have major major fund uh, major institutional investors available? <coughs> well. There's, you know, there's two parts, and if we, you know, if we look at, if we look at Boston, I just happened to be there last week, and I was in an accelerator that said that they've got, um, they've got VC firms in their building that have over eight billion dollars in, uh, in assets, assets under management, AUM. I, I mean, I'm not, I don't believe that we have eight billion dollars across all of Southern California, let alone, let alone in one building and in one accelerator. Um, so. What we're, you know, what we're really doing, and I mean, if you look at the reasons, I mean, Boston was built around MIT. Boston uh, had a little bit of a head start in terms of the evolution of the ecosystem, pulling it together, being collaborative, and Silicon Valley kind of was created the same way. Uh, I mean, that that is where venture firms went to be headquartered. I think one of the one of the distractions that we've had. Uh, is that Southern California has been looked at as four distinct ecosystems, L.A., Orange County, San Diego, and then Riverside, San Bernardino, or the Inland Empire. And uh, yeah, I think one of the things in it, more recently over the last year, year and a half, there's more, been more emphasis on Southern California as a region, not as three or four separate and competitive ecosystems inside of one. And that's beginning to attract more capital. Um, when you look at when you look at Silicon Valley and you use that as a reference, and it's almost like saying go Xerox something, uh, Silicon Valley isn't just Silicon Valley. Silicon Valley is downtown San Francisco. It's the East Bay. It's the surrounding area. Boston's not just downtown Boston. It's it's, it's frankly the entire New England area. And the same thing could be said for New York. New York. It's not New York City. It's Long Island and North Jersey and Connecticut and Westchester County. So, you know, I think as we broaden out. The, the branding and all of Southern California, uh, one of the one of the results that we'll see, one of the consequences, will be more headquartered firms here. Well, that's very interesting because it seems to me that there's been a tremendous capital flight out of L.A. into other other areas, and so to the extent that Orange County can can help stem that flight and and begin to focus more on on how to bring capital here, so the so that not just the resources, because resources can come from a variety of places, but also the returns, that the returns can be reinvested here. Well, you know, again, I think that's, that's key on anything. And I, I mentioned Visionary, and there's, you know, there's, there's, another, there's another firm, Miramar Ventures. Uh, I mean, both of those organizations have created very strong returns for investors. So returns are always going to attract more capital. There's no question about that. And, um, you know, so what we're, what we're really starting to look at also are companies that have taken outside money and just what the investment returns have been on those because they've sat here as Southern California innovation, Southern California technology. So regardless of where that capital came from, what has that company been able to produce in terms of an IRR, mm-hmm. investment results, and 
as we start to backtrack those numbers and, and, and recreate them going forward based on valuation shifts and changes uh, in speaking with the company, uh, there's, a, there's a picture that's being painted here that the companies in Southern California are providing above average returns. Right. So one of the other things when you hear that makes you feel really good about the innovation that's going on here, but it does become a competitive climate for organizations that are in another area of the country need to invest we happen to be one that was going to provide really terrific results. Um, and I'll just add, add one more example. Uh, one of the things that we hear commonly from East Coast investors is, I love West Coast innovation. I'm not real fond of Northern California valuations. Mm-hmm. And you know, there's no, there's no question it's a more expensive place to create and build your business. And as you look at that, a comparable company in Southern California versus Northern California is going to carry a much higher valuation and going to require a much greater investment or less equity interest from the investor. So Southern California companies have become very attractive. Well, now, when you talk about innovation, uh, what, what constitutes innovation? How do you define innovation in a, a, you know, in a, in a, a place like Orange County that just has enormous numbers of businesses? Well, you know, you've got you've got technological innovation, you've got consumer innovation. Uh, you know, I think what it what it is is it's really creating an idea around a specific technology, and then moving it forward into something that's commercialized. So, if you kind of look, and AI is something that's a little bit misunderstood today. AI meaning artificial intelligence, and it's not an industry. So, what what is it that AI impacts, and the technology behind AI is it's in medical technology today, so it impacts patients. It's in a variety of, of, of any kind of technology that's used, whether it's cybersecurity, it's a B2B, it's B2C. So, I, you know, I, th- I think as you look at that, we define innovation as something that's going to improve the quality of a business, improve the life of a patient on the medtech side. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> and and all right, so now... The, what role does the board play in in helping this ecosystem, this innovation ecosystem? The uh, the board the board at Octane is very uh, is very engaged. So uh, we have um, you know we're blessed with a great board. Uh, we ask all of our board members to be ambassadors of Octane. Uh, we ask them to. Uh, you know, attend board meetings. And, you know, we're a little bit unusual. We've moved from a four cycle quarterly because that's kind of what you're supposed to have to three board meetings a year. And it just fits the business uh, practice a whole lot, uh, a whole lot easier. We, we ask them to attend our signature events, our big tech and med tech event, and serve on one of the committees that supports our five strategic pillars. And those five strategic pillars are accelerate business formation and growth. So in other words, create companies that create jobs, create alternative services to drive sustained revenue. That's our OES platform. Grow our core revenue, which has become more centered around some of the content and the conferences that we do. Uh, Convene and enable the innovation ecosystem. So, you know, I don't think one organization can be the convener, but we could be a key convener. And then really build the Octane brand. And there's a lot of new branding coming early in the year as we do refresh the Octane brand. So we ask our board members to serve on a, on a committee that provides support to one of those five strategic pillars. And, and how do you measure that progress? Well, we've got, we've got metrics on almost every one of those. So, uh, you know, some of, some of them are revenue, some of those, some of them are attendance, uh, you know, measuring measuring the impact of, of your brand is a little bit more difficult. Mm-hmm. A, a bit of that is just what are people saying? Is your is your brand? And you and I were talking about this earlier mm-hmm. before the show. If it uh, you know if it takes somebody two months of discussion to understand completely what Octane does, it doesn't mean the brand's not good because you know I, I do believe that the brand stands on its own and the brand has a high quality connotation to it. What we're trying to really get to is a point that people really understand the full suite of services and products that Octane offers, regardless of what your persona is. So whether you're an investor, whether you're an entrepreneur, whether you're a service provider, you know, whether you're a strategic uh, executive, 
what is it that Octane does for you? What would your ROI be, and what would the value of that relationship be? Do you do you have any? Are there any figures on on how much capital uh, Octane has assisted companies in in uh, not necessarily placing, but but uh, uh, but providing for startups? Yeah, we we do. We tr- and you know that's one we track very closely. So. Our launchpad process works with approximately 40 companies a year, and it fluxes a little bit. This year it will probably be about 45, 46, but that starts with a nucleus of between 350 and 400 companies. So once we get to this 40, they're very well defined. They're the, the, the top of the class, and we find that on average 86% of them get funded within a 15-month period. Since 2010 – those companies have raised over two point three billion dollars, so it's 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 very sizable. Now you know again, Octane is assisted in those in both direct and indirect ways, and you know part of the Launchpad Accelerator is to really help companies prepare for that institutional round of funding. And with that, and with the returns of these companies, there's been over twenty liquidity events so far. Uh, that platform, that Launchpad platform, and Octane itself. Are very highly regarded inside of the investment community. Hmm. Uh, any any figures on number of jobs that uh, Octane has assisted in creating? Yeah, and you know this one will is an important metric for us because there's a lot of emotion behind it too. And when I talk about raising two point three billion dollars, the average person knows that that's a big number, <laughs> but doesn't really know whether that's good, bad, or indifferent. Right. Uh, and, and it's good. It's, you know, it's very good. But when we talk about jobs, that seems to emotionally reach just about anyone mm-hmm. because we've all got an interest in creating more sustainable jobs here in Orange County, uh, whether it's personally for ourselves, whether it's the future of our, of our kids so they don't have to move away from here. So we track that very closely. Uh, we do it at the end of each year. And our job creation number uh, through 2018 was uh, just under 10,300. Uh, mm-hmm. jobs, newly created jobs. The average job that's created uh, by Octane is approximately $83,000 a year. So it's classified as a high-paying job. And, um, you know, our goal, our stated goal that we created uh, last year is to create 55,000 jobs by the year 2030. Mm-hmm. And uh, I don't know where we'll end up this year. We'll we'll, we'll do those measurements uh, sometime in January. Uh, you know, but I would I would estimate that we're probably north of twelve thousand, probably getting close to thirteen thousand uh, through the end of twenty nineteen. Excellent. Well, can you stick around a little bit? We're going to take a little break here and come back and then talk about how the community can help Octane. Would love to. Imagine buying a newspaper and discovering that the news you're reading is six months old. There isn't much that stays the same for six months, and the same thing goes for background checks. In a time when so much outdated information is being passed around, it's good to know that People G2 offers something different. At People G2, we provide today's intelligence, not yesterday's news. Our value-added approach offers you a fully FCRA-compliant solution that includes up-to-the-minute information. By combining industry-leading technology with old-school human investigation, People G2 is able to give you information that is accurate right now, delivered quickly through our online system or integrated with your HR system. So ask yourself, are you comfortable working with old news or are you ready for a different kind of background check company? Visit PeopleG2.com or call 800-630-2880. That's 800-630-2880 or PeopleG2.com. Well, welcome back to the Pilgrim on the 405 on this beautiful day in Southern California. We've been talking with Bill Carpu, the uh, CEO of Octane. And and uh, what he shared with us is that, that over the, the period of time that Octane's been active, they, they have helped... Uh, they participated in creating 10,300 new jobs, uh, and these are high-paying jobs, uh, $83,000 a year median median of each job that they've created, with the goal of, by 2030, creating 55,000 new jobs for the Orange County ecosystem. And, and, and so what I want to begin to talk about, Bill, is, is as we look forward, what, what is your vision for Octane and Orange County 
over the next few years. And, and I understand that you're you're even uh, becoming part of this great park venture. Yes. So tell us about that. So we're we're excited about that. Uh, Five Point, which uh, uh, owns and has developed the great park. Uh, we uh, we have a strategic partnership with them as an organization. Uh, I think, as you've probably seen, the city of Hope is uh, is is locating a campus there. They're not they're not relocating from Duarte, but they're building a new campus. So you know, we're, there's going to be an enormous health institute. But we will be putting a um, an innovation center there uh, sometime next year. Uh, as you know, as as construction goes, I I was. Two weeks ago, I was saying it would be sometime in the first quarter, and I think we're now into the second quarter. But, <laughs> you know, in, in, in any case, uh, we're, we're really uh, – we're, we're excited to be part of something that we really believe is going to be a center of gravity for Southern California innovation for a variety of reasons. First of all, the management team and Emil Haddad uh, personally is just a visionary in terms of how they view the impact that the Great Park could have – in Southern California, um, this is more than an innovation center. It's a it's a facility. It's a location that will be work, live, be entertained, sports, uh, food. I mean, really, just everything. So, if you really kind of think about this, it's almost like building a city from the ground up. And so, you know, we're excited to play an important role in that. And you know, we think it will give us an uh, you know, an opportunity for identity of our own. It'll allow us to put an incubator, uh, have have really our 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 own space from that standpoint, and as I mentioned, really build this as a center of gravity. The um, the, the the rail lines, which we don't tend to talk about much here in Southern California, convene right there. So uh, companies that locate into the Great Park will be able to pull from San Diego or down from L.A. So we think that'll be an attractive or uh, out from uh, the well, Inland Empire, or out from the Inland Empire, and, and, and without without being on uh, the ninety one. So th- yeah. you know that that becomes that becomes a very important strategic move for us. But beyond that, uh, you know, I think it's uh, the, you know the vision the, 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 the vision for ourselves is really to integrate Southern California into this innovation network of Southern California, and have collaboration between multi- multiple organizations. And as I always say, we want to become the best version of ourselves. Um, people will often ask, uh, do, you want, do you want Southern California to look like Silicon Valley? For, for, first of all, it's, it, that's not my decision. I, 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 whether I wanted to or not, I don't even have the ability to, to, to really impact or influence that because it's such a mega question. Uh, but at the end of the day, you know, I think we become the best version of ourselves. I don't believe we should look at Silicon Valley and say, hey, let's replicate what's up there. Because what was built there was 30 years ago. It was special. It was a different time. And if we try and chase that, we're always going to be chasing it. So why not? Why not really become the best version of what Southern California has to offer? And, uh, you know, that's going to have a little bit of a different look to it. And I think it, it's more focused to the key technologies and the key industries that are here and the strengths of the, of the region. Well, and, and what I notice is that there are, uh, in Silicon Valley, it was a lot of that had to do with Berkeley and uh, Lawrence Livermore Labs and, and uh, Stanford. And in in Boston, a lot of that had to do with MIT. MIT, and yeah. here we have UCI, and UCI is a tremendously strong, powerful, world class research university. And building around that uh, it seems to me to be be beginning to understand that that's more than 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 just a, a small college that people get to go to. Yeah, I think you're right, Will. I mean, U- UCI is a great partner of ours. Uh, they're they're a great institution, and at the same time, one of the one of the differences that we have in Southern California is we are also not dependent on any one institution. Mm-hmm. So, as you as you highlight UCI, you know, let's not forget about UCLA and Chapman and USC and Caltech and UCSD, and. So in many instances, when you when you kind of look at Boston and you center around MIT and you go to Silicon Valley and you center around Stanford, um, they become maybe more of a one trick pony. And I think we're, we've got a, a greater level of diversity 
and a much greater university ecosystem also. Uh, and it doesn't it doesn't underscore it. You know, it doesn't uh, suggest that any of any of those organizations are not tremendous. We just have more than one, and that's great for us. Well, one of the things that I found out uh, in interviewing people uh, from the launch pad at the uh, your your event, the MTIF event, uh, was I was amazed that they were so articulate about uh, focusing on improving client uh, results. They they I didn't hear a lot about uh, how much money they were going to make or how famous they were going to be. It had to do with how many people can we help in this health, uh, this health sphere? How can we help their results come out? It was amazing to me to hear that over and over again. Well, you know, the, it's, it's interesting that you're saying that because having come really from pure tech and not med tech previously, everything was around customer centricity. And when you really look at the med tech companies, it's patient centricity. And it's patient outcomes. It's patient results. So, I, you know, I, I agree with you. Now, you'll, you, you would have a different spin if you talk to tech companies. They're not as focused on, on the outcome for the customer than as they are for the development of their own business. It, it's just because you don't have the, imas- the, the emotional attachment to a patient. Well, and, and what, what I've been fascinated with is what Peter Diamandis is doing up in, in Santa Monica with uh, – uh, with with his work with Singularity University and with uh, 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 Focus 360, what and and what I hear out of participating in that is the focus is on how do we make the world a better place? How do we solve these major problems? And I don't see the connection yet between Octane and the other organizations in Orange County and that kind of forward thinking, which feels a little like uh, like like Silicon Valley but it's right here in Santa Monica. Yeah. You're you're right and he's done you know he has done a very good job on that. Part of that is there's there's a Silicon Valley mentality that he's mm-hmm. brought down to that. And you know we're working our way through that but you know just go back I mean 3 years ago this was very siloed. So mm-hmm. you know if you if you if you take a look at where we were as a variety of different organizations solving that. Uh, you know, I would tell you that we were very scattered. Mm-hmm. Well, I'm not even sure that we have the the same endpoint. We, we 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 knew we wanted to make the place a better place, but what really was that? Mm-hmm. And I think today you've got organizations that all have the same endpoint in mind. What's the what's the endpoint? What's it mean? What's it mean whether it's in terms of company creation, job creation, patient outcomes? And now the final layer is to just find the proper level of collaboration and intersection between all the organizations to leverage that. And you know, not be repetitive on something someone else is doing and doing really well, but be more reliant on it. Right. Right. Well, I, what what's interesting to me is uh, would be would be picking up on people like David Asprey, who is is doing a lot of things. Is not in med tech, but is in health tech. I mean, he's he's coming across with brand new ideas and challenging the status quo, similar to uh, Peter Diamandis, and and to somehow get them into the conversation that Octane is having. So it's not just a conversation with ourselves, but we're really putting in, uh, inviting in those people who may not be here but certainly are connected to here and and bring in a, that kind of excitement enthusiasm and dedication to changing the world. Yes, yeah, I mean you're giving me a good idea on on a couple of names here as you're as you're bringing that up. Um it, it's 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 not that it hasn't been started though. You know, we we have uh we have some good relationships right now that we've started to build from the Denver ecosystem. I mentioned mm-hmm. Boston before mm-hmm. and and New York. So what you know what we're what we're doing and have done over the past two years is getting the perspectives from other ecosystems that have been successful, and probably to some extent will maybe move Silicon Valley because it was such an obvious. Mm-hmm. And as I said before, we did we don't necessarily want to just fall into and follow that model because no. I think that's a bit of a fool's errand. So right. so what what have been some more recent ecosystems that have developed and learn some lessons from them. So, right. you know, we are very open to, 
you know, as I said, Denver, Salt Lake City, New York, Boston, uh, learning from what's worked for that for them. Yeah, I don't I don't think it's a particular advantage for us to become Silicon Beach or Silicon Orange or something like that. We have our own way of being in the world, and and what I'm really curious about is what would happen if we dropped these very significant committed people. Uh, not just necessarily from Silicon Valley, but around the world, who are who are challenging the status quo. Uh, in in many cases, what I hear Octane doing is challenging the status quo in Orange County, because Orange County has a lot of retired people, a lot of retired wealthy people who are here, and and perhaps without being challenged, their purpose is to enjoy life, enjoy their grandkids. You know, make sure that their investments are doing fine. And what I see Octane doing is challenging that mentality to saying, we can be an innovative center. We can make some difference. And what I'm curious about is, is what are the differences that we want to make in the world? And how do we take what I observed in, in listening to the Launchpad people, that in their specific niche, they were challenging and they were making a, a difference. And how can we become that place... Uh, that Orange County becomes a place where we, uh, as an ecosystem, are challenging the places that are constraining us. Yeah, you know, if you if you again kind of look back, uh, we had a, we actually had a retention problem a couple of years ago. That companies that were started here got initial funding here vacated and mm-hmm. left, mm-hmm. and they left for a variety of reasons. One was investors wanted them closer to them. Mm -hmm. Uh, But the real reason the investors wanted them closer to them, they didn't necessarily have confidence that the ecosystem here could support and help grow that. We've gotten past that. Mm -hmm. Uh, The incidence of companies really leaving uh, has diminished to almost uh, a a nominal uh, portion from that standpoint. So I think as you look to correct anything, you need to correct retention first. Mm-hmm. So we've done that. Now there's been now there's some great initiatives underway uh, to bring companies globally into Orange County. So the Irvine Chamber, for example, has led a delegation over the last three years to the UK to help bring UK-based companies here to Orange County. That does not mean they're closing shop. It means mm-hmm. this is where their U.S. headquarters would be, mm-hmm. and. Isn't Orange County a better place maybe than the East Coast because it gives you a jumping off spot to the Asian markets? It's the fifth largest economy in the world. So if you can make it in uh, Southern California, I'm sorry, California as a state, you've you've made it in one of the largest economies. Um, and I, you know, I, I want to tell you there's uh, there's six or seven companies that have agreed to make that move and locate here. So I, I think the next step in this evolution that you're kind of talking about is how do we as an ecosystem now attract companies to actually move here? Mm -hmm. And whether that's internally from the country or whether it's just establishing a good position here in Orange County and Southern California, that's that's the next step that we've got to embark on. And and doing that would attract capital. Sure it would. And and it would certainly attract talent. And and when you attract that talent, it also becomes a, a model, a template for other talent to either build or to uh, uh, accumulate around that ta- organization. See, see, now it's interesting because it depends, I think, on what side. I, I mean, I tend to agree with you. I think I think as companies move in, your talent becomes even more robust. Uh, but the other day, I was in a fairly good sized organization here, uh, and in other. Uh, I won't name them, but uh, uh, you know, Google's increasing their footprint here, and they viewed that as very negative. Mm-hmm. That 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 Google would be pulling some of their employees. My point exactly. Yeah. We are talking to each other. Exactly. We're not talking to the world. Silicon Valley talks to the world. Boston talks to the world. That's our next step: is to talk to the world and and to proclaim that we are more than a, a, a wonderful beach community with great weather. And that's a, that's a great piece, and that's going to be part of our culture. Uh-huh. And there's an attraction on that, but it's got to be viewed, we've got to be viewed as one of the top spots, if not the best place, to right. start your business, to get capital, to grow it, and then to live the lifestyle that you want to live. I think, I think that is a wonderful additional piece 
but the real challenge is getting the people who are committed to making a difference in the world. So, I'm you know I've got a uh, I've, I've got a bias right now that there's there's um, you, you you were talking before about we're talking to ourselves, mm-hmm. and one of the things that we've got and we continue to try and push is individuals, organizations, and the community getting more engaged in what we, Octane, are trying to build. But again, I, 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 I look at this and broaden it out. It's the universities. It's all the other organizations that, that do things similar to us. How do they get engaged? Mm-hmm. And we still have too many people on the sidelines. And what happens is there's a scarcity model. So the amount of organizations or the amount of people that could supply the capital, that could supply the resources, the human resources, Mm -hmm. the talent or anything is limited. And so it it becomes a zero sum game is that when (laughs) when someone comes in and takes some of that, it takes it away from someone else. Because we're talking to each other. Because we're talking to each other. So a big a big portion of this and the piece that I implore to the audience today and, and in any of the discussions I have is we need to get people off the sidelines. Mm-hmm. And we'd love everybody on the playing field. Frankly, I'd love people even if they were on the sidelines right now. If I, if I use the football analogy, we still have too many people that are in the stands, and we've got a lot of people that are rooting us on, but they're still tailgating in the, in the, in the parking lot. <laughs> let's get them into the stadium. Let's get them on the sidelines and eventually get them onto the field. And that's just going to build a stronger ecosystem for all of us. Right. Well, I can sense we're going to have a great conversation uh, moving forward about how to, how to move this conversation about Orange County into the world. So that we're really talking about how do we make changes in the world that are going to be significant for patients as well as, as, as job holders, people in schools. How do, we, how do we make some significant impacts on the constraints that we have in the world today? Well, you know, I think as you as you look at this, a lot of that is going to tie back to the medical device companies mm-hmm. and, the, and the medical companies. So you look at Edwards Life Sciences, for example. I yeah, mean, absolutely. they measure everything in terms of patient outcomes. Yes. Uh, if I look at Visionary Ventures, you know, the, the, the fund that Octane founded, uh, it impacts – the nine investments impact over 27 million people, mm-hmm. uh, you know, throughout the world – just those nine companies. So it, it's more about building that type of innovation and focusing on what our core competencies are mm-hmm. here, ophthalmology being one of them, mm-hmm. medical device being another. Excellent. Thanks, Bill, for being with us today. This is, uh, this is exciting, and it sounds like there's a great conversation that's moving forward with Octane and the rest of the Orange County ecosystem. Thanks very much for having me, Will. Take care. So there we are, uh, one of the key people in uh, Orange County, talking about the future of Orange County, the future of Octane, and the future of the innovation ecosystem. Another way of seeing California businesses thrive. You've been listening to The Pilgrim on the 405 with Will Christ. 